Yo, what up everybody, it's your boy here, MC, and welcome back to Swahili Nation, Swahili to the world. Guys, if you're new to this family, you all know what to do, guys. Without wasting time, subscribe. You all know that we bring good content every single day. Subscribe right here. I mean, not subscribe. You can follow me on social media, Mika Chava right here, Swahili Nation right here. Stay connected with Instagram, uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, whatever it is, guys, we are there. Twitter, Mika Chava right here is there. But also, guys, you can subscribe, turn on the patient button so that you do not miss all the beautiful content we have. There's so many exciting things are coming up. All right, I have an amazing interview. It's coming on this Wednesday. I interview with one of my friends from Brazil and what she think about Africa. We spoke about a lot of good stuff. The podcast is already available right now on iTunes, Spotify, SoundCloud. Just write One Africa, Mika Chavala. You'll see their podcast. You can listen to all the episodes we have there. We have like 14 different episodes already. And also, um, I'm going to have a sit down with Ambassador from Kenya on uh, the beginning of August. So stay connected for that interview as well. Also, this Friday, we're going to be releasing an amazing interview that I, I've, I'm going to do with your boy Lil Belil, all the way from Somalia. Musician, stay connected for that. Stay right there. Don't go nowhere. So there's a lot of good stuff, guys. And as you can see, man, you cannot wait. And I cannot wait. I mean, you cannot wait and I cannot wait. But today... I'm going to do reaction on this one video that I got is about Ethiopia then and now Ethiopia then and now a little bit of the history of Ethiopia. I haven't watched this video. It's my first time to do, uh, but I'm going to watch it right now with you guys and react on it. And you guys, since you are Ethiopian, I believe Ethiopian person prepared this video. So I hope you guys, you can also, if there's anything that is not right, you guys feel free to actually correct it. But all in all, Let's jump right away. I'll teach you guys a little bit of Swahili. Okay, let's say the history of Ethiopia. In Swahili, you can say, Historia ya Ethiopia. The history of Ethiopia. Historia ya Ethiopia. That's very easy, right? Anyways, let's go. Mm. Beth in Africa. I love that sound already. You don't have much going on in life besides your goats and tending to your land. One day, Dang, I hope this video doesn't have copyright. That your goats starting eating this weird berry. You think to yourself, don't you all prefer okay. grass? You then notice your goats getting high, too excited to even sleep during the night. Wow. Being a curious individual yourself, you pick up these mysterious berries, mash them, and turn it into a drink. Then you start getting high. You get so high that you made it through your evening prayers without falling asleep. <laughs> I've now, done this, man. This fascinating fruit That's a coffee right there. Discovering, discovering of coffee. There's no explanation, but you can. So you bring these berries to your local priests. Then they tried these berries and proclaimed, Holy sh**, we can make a business. <laughs> Father Marcos, what should we call this holy fruit? Father Yashak, what is the name of the land we live in? Why, it's Ethiopia, of course. No, you idiot. I mean, our province. <laughs> Man, this is cool. Kafa? Yes, mm -hmm. that's a catchy name. Kafa. Kafa. Coffee. Coffee. We're gonna call it coffee. Dang. And that's how coffee was born. But besides being the best of this lovable energy drink, is there anything else to Ethiopia's history? Hell yes. Famous for being the only African nation to escape European colonization and influenced by all three of the Abrahamic Ethiopia is a badass, you know what I'm saying? In Africa can match Ethiopia's rich history. With Ethiopia mm -hmm. being currently embroiled in a huge damn conflict with Egypt, there's no better time to pay attention to this growing East African power. So grab yourself mm. a cup of Ethiopian coffee and let's take a deeper look to the early days of the big mama of Africa. Huh. This guy is good, man. Knows how to tell a story. Abesha. 
Story City. To History City. My name is Tim. Oh man. We'll delve into the first African country in our long list of nations to cover. Damn. Love you, brother, already. Is a long ass list. To understand Ethiopia's importance to mankind's history, we will need to take a quick trip to the Awash Valley in northeastern Ethiopia. In 19 and I hope you allow me to do reaction on this. <laughs> this is good. A shout out to you, man. This is not easy. The southern ape was found in the far region of Ethiopia and was given the creative name of A. L two eight eight one, but you might know her better as Lucy. While it is still up for debate whether Lucy is a direct ancestor of modern day humans or simply a closely related relative, it is still an extremely important discovery for the origins of the human species. The peoples that inhabited Ethiopia eventually diverged into three linguistic groups, the Semitic, mm -hmm. the Cushitic, and the Amotic. This might seem like a trivial fact from thousands of years ago, but trust me, this will prove to be important later on. During some time around the 8th to 7th centuries BC, the kingdom of Damat calmed down Joe Rogan. I know it looks like DMT. <laughs> Damat was formed in the northern Tigray region of Ethiopia. Dang, the beautiful the Ethiopia right there. That it was heavily influenced by the Arabian kingdom of Saba or Sheba. If you remember the mm, biblical story Sheba. of Solomon, or if you're a big fan of classical music, you might recall the name the Queen of Sheba. The connection between Sheba and Ethiopia eventually led to the legend that the son of Solomon and the Queen of Sheba, Menelik, returned to Ethiopia. And to this mm -hmm. day, the descendants of the Ethiopian emperors are direct descendants of the wise king of Israel. By around 300 BC, so you guys are wise. It's important. I'm Ethiopian, guys. <laughs> no longer pass through the Ethiopian highlands, mm -hmm. and the kingdom was split up into a messy bunch of city states. But mm -hmm. one of these city states stood out among the rest with the name of Axum. The Axumites consolidated their power by the first century BC, and they were the powerhouse of East Africa for the next few centuries, excelling in culture, military, and trade. And in the words of the Iranian prophet Mani, the kingdom of Axum was only matched in its prestige by Persia, Rome, and China. Axum's power went beyond it's just such a perfect editing, yeah. but reached as far as the. It's a lot of time to prep video like this. Shout During out to you, man. Of its existence, the Axumites consisted of both followers of the Semitic god Astar as well as Jews, and it was common practice for the Axumites to erect giant obelisks next to the graves of their kings. Even though it was a rich kingdom, prior to the 4th century, Ethiopia was pretty much cut off from the known world, only having trade mm -hmm. contacts with the neighboring Egyptians and Arabs. But a young Greek slave brought to the shores of this African empire was about to open the Ethiopians' eyes to a whole new world. Mm hmm Come on, boy. The land of the three faiths. All right, I think that is Orthodox, when Islam, and Christianity. Today, we tend to think of this this or this but not so much this a teal zone right there and there's still an ongoing but mistaken belief that christianity is a european religion this is the all the dust the christian of faith emerged in the levant was first spread to the anatolian greeks and was accepted by various communities in asia and africa before it even reached western europe while Europe was still clinging to paganism and Roman polytheism, Christianity was already adopted as the state religion first by Armenia and then, out of all expectations, by Ethiopia. In the early yes. 4th century, a Syrian Greek boy called That's what's up. I know this one. along with his brother were captured by the Ethiopians during a voyage that didn't go very well. But in a surprising turn of events, he was brought to the Ethiopian king Azana's court. You boy! What do you have to offer <laughs> so that I don't snap your tiny neck? Your master <laughs> ever heard of Jesus Christ? Your merchants love him, and not only will he forgive your sins, but if you become his follower, your business with the Egyptians and Romans will skyrocket. Your fame will spread. Your kingdom will become strong. Say less. <laughs> this guy is really good, man. He is really good. Countries in the world to wow, man. With he found his passion. Tewahero Church becoming established sometime around 340 AD. Axum even had regular mm. contact with their fellow Orthodox Eastern Romans, and Ethiopia had a strong navy that allowed it to dominate the Red Sea trade. A lasting legacy of the Axumites would be the Gea script, one of the few native African writing systems still in use today mm. that was influenced by the southern Arabs. 
once just the sacred script of the Ethiopian church, it was eventually adopted by Ethiopian languages such as Amharic mm. and Tigrinya. So, at this point, we covered two of the Ethiopia's connections to the Abrahamic religions. From Judaism with the Queen of Sheba and Christianity with the Aksumites, but what about Islam? Around 615, in the early years of Islam, the followers of Muhammad were persecuted in their homeland of Arabia, and the early Muslims escaped to the kingdom of Aksum in an event known as the Hijrat. Under the Aksumite king Arma, they were settled in the town of Nagash which means that the earliest Muslims in the African continent resided in Ethiopia. By the 10th century, Aksum was in a terminal state of decline, with Islamic forces capturing Egypt in the north and diverting trade away from the Red Sea, which led the Aksumites to eventually abandon the coast and retreat mm. to the western highlands. The death blow came years later when a Jewish queen named Judith laid waste to the Aksumite kingdom in a campaign Ethiopia and the queen right there. Ethiopia. Now, it's important to understand that Ethiopia's history becomes a little muddled during the Middle Ages. With the fall mm -hmm. of Aksum, Ethiopia was replaced by the Zagwe in the 12th century. And just like Damant, Zagwe was shrouded in mystery. However, it was under their rule that the world-renowned... Oh, Arabia I know that place. Built. Oh, I'm sorry. These guys didn't build these churches. They were literally cut out of rocks. Yet, yeah, step aside, Brunelleschi. These guys are the real architectural MVPs. By 1270, the Zagwe's mm -hmm. were overthrown. You got that right. Named Yakuno Amma, Ethiopia, who claims that bad he was the direct descendant <laughs> of the Aksumites, and therefore King Solomon. Mm. The following centuries under the Solomonic dynasty were quite the dynamic years. Come on, boy. Ethiopia had been cut off from Europe for centuries, and it was Come on, boy. a Christian land surrounded by a sea of Islam. Things started to Come on, boy. for the Ethiopians as alliance mm. options became fewer and fewer. For the next three centuries, the Muslim Somali Sultanates seemed to edge closer and closer, but Ethiopia was about to make an unlikely friend. This friend wasn't even from the same continent, but from a distant land. They believed in an ancient legend, a legend where a Christian king lived in the Far East. These people, all from Europe, have a small obsession with finding spice and building ships. Those are spices. As the Portuguese. Oh. The tale of Presta John. And since the next episode will be a country starting with F, don't forget to comment down below which country you'd like to see. And without further ado, let's return to the Portuguese explorers. Finding Presta John was one of the goals of the Portuguese during the age of This guy, Asia. he knows how to do you you story and YouTube. You didn't have to go all the way to the Far East. I respect no you, man. Deus, we found the legendary Presta John. <laughs> Emperor of Ethiopia. Nah, nah. Your Prester John. At a time when Ethiopia was under attack by its Muslim neighbors, the Portuguese proved to be a useful ally since they provided something very useful when it comes to warfare. Guns. In the 16th century, Ethiopia and the Somali Adal Sultanate were locked in what was essentially a proxy mm. war, meaning that it was a conflict with the interests of other bigger powers in mind. Behind the Somalis was the powerful Ottoman Empire, and backing the Ethiopians yeah. was the Portuguese Empire. Both these great naval powers dreamed of controlling the lucrative spice trade in the Indian Ocean. And whoever's ally wow. controlled the Red Sea holds the key to victory. The Adal Sultanate was trained with Ottoman tactics. But in the end, good tactics wasn't enough to beat Portuguese gunpowder. The Ethiopian-Portuguese friendship was all well and good until the Portuguese intruded a bit too much into Ethiopia's personal space. During the 1620s, Emperor Susenyos I mm -hmm. of Ethiopia converted to Roman Catholicism. Mm. Whether he did this out of personal conviction or wanted a stronger alliance with the Portuguese, mm. we can't know for sure. But one thing for certain was that this move really pissed off the Ethiopians. Susenyos eventually mm. abdicated his throne to the Orthodox. rebellion. And under his son, Facilides, Ethiopia's Portuguese Jesuits were expelled and the nation experienced a new cultural climax. The imperial mm. capital of Gondar became the center of the architectural projects of the royal family with Ethiopian Baroque influence castles, as well as cathedrals covering the city. Remember the mm. part about how thousands of years ago, Semitic, Kushitic, Omoric, three linguistic groups? Well, the royalty mm. belonged to the Semitic Amhara people, but they were not on the best terms with their Kushitic Somali and Oromo neighbors. And the mm. Amhara peoples were just kind of doing their own thing in the West. Yeah, it's all very confusing, but the most important thing to understand is that Ethiopia is a very ethnically divided country. 
Since the Amhara emperors hadn't treated their no. neighbors as kindly as they should, Praying the for that. tensions eventually led to the fall of the empire. Everything mm. quickly fell apart, and Ethiopia entered into a century-long anarchy known as the Zemene Mesafins, or the Age of Princes. A hundred years of lawless, loneliness. From wow, to this video is very long, guys. Princes, all right. Into 1855, the Oromo mm, princes had 27 minutes. The entire country, the emperor only serving a ceremonial role, mm -hmm. kind of like old-time Japan. During the age of princes, life was especially rough since the armies of the warring princes would ravage the countryside, and raids and pillaging became part of daily life, kind of like old-time Japan. And it wasn't until a strong mm. emperor came along, defeated the Ormo princes with a more modern military, and tried to westernize, kind of like old time. Yeah, you get where I'm going with this. The ruling emperor, Tewodros II, attempted to form an alliance with the British Empire mm. to remove Ethiopia's Muslim neighbors. But after years mm. and years of religious wars in Europe, Britain wasn't so interested in another one. But for mm. Tewodros, this was seen as an insult. Oh, oh. And he had the <laughs> and with the country mm. held hostage. But that wasn't the smartest move, since there is a general rule in warfare written by the wise Sun Tzu, which is gun, beat, spear. The Ethiopian army was armed mainly with spears gun, and outdated spirit. muskets, while the British forces had modern rifles and artillery. And just like you guessed, the Ethiopians took a beating. Ethiopia was utterly humiliated and even had their capital occupied. To avoid capture by the British, Emperor Tewodros committed suicide. But Ethiopia had a speedy recovery. Under the next two capable emperors, Ethiopia made up with Britain and became allies and once again dominated East Africa. In the 1880s, under the leadership of Emperor Menelik II, Ethiopia expanded from its western highlands to Oromo and Sadama lands in the south and the Somali and Afar lowlands in the west. And by 1886, oh. the modern-day oh. Ethiopian capital city of Addis Ababa, <laughs> it's just so fun to say, Addis Ababa, was created in the central province. <laughs> but before the Ethiopians could start their new little golden age, they had another mm -hmm. colonial power to deal with. You might be thinking, mm -hmm. God, he's going to talk about the British again. <laughs> Mr. No, B. This problem did not originate from London, but from the Mediterranean. This problem is an Italian problem. You see, while the rest oh. of Western Europe had begun colonizing Africa, the Italians were a step too late. Egypt was taken by the British, the Maghreb was taken by France, and almost no free real estate was left in Africa. Until the Italians found this place called Ethiopia. Alright guys, um, I'm gonna stop here, and then I'll come back to do reaction. Uh, for the second part so appreciate you stopping by check it out the second part right now don't forget love one another and spread peace whatever you are so nation swahili to the war i'm out of here